This video is brought to you by Brilliant. The Labour Party, ever since its inception in the early 1900s, has fought various internal battles over what it stands for. This tension usually exists around whether the party should primarily represent those on the left of the party, who advocate more for the implementation of socialist principles, or those on the right of the party, those that are more pragmatic about the changes they want the party to make. Only a few years ago, Jeremy Corbyn helmed the Labour Party and reshaped it to fit his more left-wing view of politics. Under him, the party advocated for the scrapping of tuition fees, renationalising public utilities and railways, and the reversal of austerity cuts. Now the party is led by Sakir Starmer, who has made a concerted effort to demonstrate that the party has changed under his leadership. The question is though, aside from just not being led by Jeremy Corbyn anymore, what exactly does the Labour Party stand for at the moment? If Keir Starmer is elected Prime Minister later this year, as the polls all suggest he will be, what sort of government will he lead? Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Now, the most important issue at the moment for the country is the cost of living crisis. Over the last few years, high inflation and high interest rates have really started to have an effect on the standard of living of workers and families up and down the country. In the last year, Starmer is really trying to demonstrate that the Labour Party can be trusted on the economy. This has been a little tricky for Starmer though, as when he ran for the leadership originally, he tried to paint himself out as more of a radical reformer, who'd be willing to make big, expensive changes to the country. He committed to ending tuition fees, saying that the Labour Party must stand by its commitment to end the national scandal of spiralling student debt and abolish tuition fees. However, in his attempt to demonstrate fiscal responsibility, he backtracked on this, saying that the country now finds itself in a different financial situation. In an interview with us last year, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves said this of the policy. It would cost billions of pounds to get rid of university tuition fees. And look, the truth is, in the economic situation we find ourselves in, uh, to commit to that without being able to say where the money is going to come from, it's just a false promise. The thing is, this isn't the only costly policy that Labour have backtracked on in the last year. Starmer has also backtracked on the commitment to increase tax on the top 5% of earners. Again, defending this by saying that we are now in a different situation and adding that we've got the highest tax burden since World War II. And, well, the most publicised economic U-turn was Labour's abandonment of their Green Prosperity Plan. This was a plan to invest £28 billion in the economy to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Starmer dropped this plan following the Tories' use of this as an attack line against Labour's economic credibility. For his part, Starmer blamed the aftermath of Liz Truss's mini-budget for the decision to drop the plan, although this caused a lot of frustration from people in his own party, with some using this as evidence that, as Prime Minister, Starmer would not take the climate crisis seriously enough. These critics would also say that his decision to drop all the other commitments mentioned shows that Starmer is a man lacking any real ideology or conviction, and that his government would be more reactive than proactive. However, Starmer's allies would argue that these U-turns all seem to be part of a wider plan. He knows that Labour has often struggled to gain economic credibility with the electorate. Only a few years ago, the Resolution Foundation claimed that the 2019 Labour manifesto would have led to an extra £135 billion in spending, which would have brought spending as a share of GDP to its highest level since the Second World War. So, Starmer's decision to U-turn on expensive policy commitments is a way of signalling to the electorate that Labour can be trusted with the economy now. This will inevitably lead to the criticism that Starmer isn't actually all that ideologically distinct from the Tories. After all, it was only last week that the Labour leader said that he'd support Sunak's national insurance cuts, fuel duty cuts and NHS investments. However, Starmer likely reasons that this is worth it for being more trusted on the economy, and to be fair, as YouGov polling has shown, Labour has been more trusted on the economy than the Tories since mid-2022. So it's clear that Labour would be relatively moderate when it comes to the economy, with them being restrained on public spending and on tax cuts. But what about other policy areas? Well, on the international front, it seems that Starmer would continue the stance of the current Tory government. 
Following the October the 7th attack, he made clear that the Labour Party condemned the actions of Hamas and that they support a two-state solution, putting him yet again in lockstep with the Prime Minister. Now, it is worth noting that there were some that were frustrated in the following weeks that Starmer didn't go further in his condemnation of the Israeli response. Both Sunak and Starmer have been reluctant to call for a full ceasefire in Gaza, with them both instead insisting on a sustainable ceasefire. However, when we look at domestic policy, it does seem that there are some key ways that Starmer would try and set his government aside from the Tories. Firstly, the Labour leader has insisted that his government will be radical when it comes to house building. They promised to build one and a half million more homes over the next parliament, and promised to give dibs to first-time buyers through a government-backed mortgage guarantee scheme. For their part, the Tories have also been keen to demonstrate that they're putting an effort into easing the housing crisis, although they've tended to look more at the demand side by, for example, promising to introduce 99% mortgages and promising to make renting fairer via the Renters' Reform Bill. Labour are clearly aiming to be far more radical on housing than the Tories then. And to be fair, this is something that Starmer himself has pointed out as a huge area of disagreement between his party and the Tories. Another area of disagreement with the Tories is on the net zero transition. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Starmer has ditched the costly £28 billion a year promise, but he is sticking by the plan to try and decarbonise electricity by 2030. This is a significant difference from the Tories, who have, in the last year, pushed back net zero targets. So, all in all, it's clear that Starmer has been keen to demonstrate that the Labour Party has changed and that it can be trusted on the economy. While this has led to a seemingly less ambitious policy platform, Starmer has maintained some key policies, which he hopes will prove to the electorate that the party will improve Britain. We'll just have to wait and see if this policy platform gets more ambitious when the full manifesto is released in the run-up to the general election. A lot of stuff that we talk about at TLDR News can seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive into economics and detailed data, which is why we use Brilliant.org to keep us sharp. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant is a learning platform designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, which is also how we structure TLDR videos. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than just watching lectures. Plus, all content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So, while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. Learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do, both for your personal and professional growth. Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in minutes a day, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time. It's the opposite of mindless scrolling. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data, all of which uses real-world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions, something politicians could really learn from. Anyway, these are for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis, with a fully built-out suite of new content, from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. And you can truly learn by doing, as you'll be working with real datasets from sources like Starbucks, Twitter, Spotify, and more. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, click on the link in the description. You also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Brilliant for their support of TLDR News.